Hi guys, welcome back to another Hugh Jeffries video. In this video, I'm going to be restoring this neglected iPod Classic. The iPod itself has deep scratches on the front and the display's coating is flaking away. Around back, the iPod has a number of dints and is scuffed beyond recognition of what it once looked like. I found this for sale locally and paid $30 for the device. While that might sound like more than what you'd expect, a working good condition iPod can go between $200 and $400 here in Australia. I'll be using a new front, back and battery to be able to make this poor iPod look like new again. The iPod itself is currently in a working state, however I'm unsure on the condition of its internal hard drive. These older iPods still use a mechanical disc, so I'll boot the device up into diagnostic mode by holding the center and rewind button on startup. This will get us into the hidden diagnostic menu where I can perform manual tests on individual components of the iPod. What I'm most interested in is the hard drive section, so loading up the smart data we can take a look at it. I'm unsure on what retracts are, and I wasn't able to find any info about them. However, what I'm most focusing on here is the pending and reallocated sectors. A large number of reallocated or pending sectors would suggest your drive is failing. While mine only has one pending sector, while I have the device open, I'll be replacing the drive with an SD card. Comparing this to another iPod, you can see the hard drive hasn't had much use in comparison with my 5th gen iPod having almost 13,000 startups on the hard drive. Once I'm done, I can reset the iPod which will just reboot it back into the operating system. You can also see this iPod has clearly been opened before which should make it much easier for me to get into. And to do that, I'm going to be using a bunch of these little thin metal prying tools. Now these are only about one millimeter in thickness and you need to insert them in the groove between the back and front. To actually open the iPod, you'll need to press these tools down to release the clips that are actually holding the iPod together. I'll work my way around the iPod, starting from one of the sides, then the top, and then proceeding on to the last side. I won't touch the bottom of the iPod as it's easy to damage the dock connector. Once you have the three sides loose, you can just wiggle the back panel free and move it to one side. Now with releasing mine, a whole lot of dust and a screw fell out. So we'll need to take a look at that later on. I'll disconnect the battery and open the two halves of an iPod like a book being careful of the cable that connects the two halves. Taking a closer look inside this iPod, you can see it's absolutely filthy, and that slight gap in the frame has allowed lots of dirt and dust to build up inside. I can also tell that the battery isn't original and would be the reason this device had been opened. I'll remove this mechanical hard drive and put it to the side and disconnect the rear housing. With the two halves separated, it's now time to remove the six screws holding the faceplate onto the iPod. With those screws removed, I'll disconnect the LCD cable and separate the frame from the faceplate. Now this is slightly adhered, so I used the Jimmy tool to separate the two halves. With some gentle prying, I was able to remove the LCD and faceplate in one piece. Then I can go ahead and remove the LCD screen from the faceplate by lifting it out with a spudger. As the bracket that went behind the LCD had quite a lot of dirt on it, I could use some alcohol to clean that up. Moving back across to the motherboard, I can inspect all of the buttons have the spaces aligned correctly. These can fall off and result in the buttons not functioning correctly. I can use a brush to clean up all of the dust that is on the motherboard. I'll also take this opportunity to clean off all of the buttons before reinstalling them on the iPod. It's now time to install our new faceplate. As far as I know, there's no way to remove scratches from aluminium, so I'll just have to replace the whole assembly. Reinstalling the LCD onto the frame, I can then line up our new faceplate, position it into place, and make sure the click wheel is aligned correctly. Next, I can carefully reconnect the flex cable for the LCD and lock it into position before reinstalling the six screws securing the faceplate into position. Moving across to the back panel, I can remove that old battery and we can take a closer look at it. It appears this is a replacement battery from Sanyo. The interior of this back housing is looking pretty dirty, although we're going to be replacing it with a nice shiny new one, so I'm going to need to take out the remaining components. It turns out that loose screw from earlier came from the headphone jack assembly. 
I'll need to remove all the screws securing the headphone jack and hold switch into position before carefully peeling up the cable and removing it from the back housing. I'll also need to transfer across the dock port surround. You can see our new housing is wrapped in plastic to help protect it from getting scratched during installation. Before I install all the components, I'm going to use some alcohol to clean them up as best I can. Alcohol tends to work wonders on dirt and grime, so I was able to make the hold switch, headphone jack, and dock surround look much cleaner. With our components cleaned up, we can reinstall them into our new back housing. Reinstalling all of the Phillips screws back into position. I can also put in the replacement battery, which should bring us some pretty decent battery life. I'll also put a fresh piece of adhesive under the cable to hold it in its proper position. Reconnecting the two halves, it's now time to sort out the hard drive for this iPod. The one inside is an Apple branded, Samsung made 80 gigabyte hard drive. I'll be replacing this with a 128 gig SD card in a compact flash adapter in a ZIF to compact flash adapter card. So there's quite a lot of adapting going on here, but this will work fine, and it kind of reminds me of a modern day MacBook. With our 128 gigs of flash storage now installed, I can flip the two halves of the iPod together and reconnect up the battery, flick across the hold switch, which should turn on the device, and thankfully we are greeted with the use iTunes to restore screen. Launching into iTunes, we can reinstall the software onto the iPod. Now this unfortunately failed a number of times and it took me 45 minutes to realize that I blocked Apple's update servers on my router, so I had to hotspot from my Blackberry to be able to download the iPod software file. I found formatting the SD card in macOS extended journal prior to doing the iTunes restore worked best. With the iPod restored and ready to go, all that's left to do is clip the two halves of the iPod back together and remove all that plastic protective film. To protect our iPod, I can apply a series of plastic screen protectors throughout. The one I'll install right now is for the back and this should prevent any scratches from occurring on our new housing. If you can't find one for an iPod, you could always cut down a larger iPhone screen protector to fit on the back. Lastly, removing the plastic film, we're done. So this is it, an almost brand new looking iPod Classic 7th generation. Equipped with a 128 gig SD card, this iPod will be speedy and durable. While not as crazy as my custom 5th generation, with its huge 3000 mAh battery lasting around 10 days and a 256 gig SSD, this iPod is adequate for what most people would be needing from an iPod music player. So this won't be replacing my daily 5th generation iPod. This particular model of iPod was released in 2007, which is the same year as the first iPhone. Apple continued selling this same iPod model until 2014, the same year of the iPhone 6. So Apple pushed the same iPod without ever updating it for many years. This was the last iPod of its sort. After Apple discontinued these iPods, the resale value skyrocketed, and even in 2020, they're still sought after, with many selling between 300 to 400 Australian dollars. My total for this iPod comes to $134, or $96 without the SD card as price can differ between manufacturer and capacity. This is actually my third 7th generation iPod Classic. However, unfortunately, the other two units I found abandoned and still don't work. Let me know down in the comments, would you like to see me mod in Bluetooth capabilities into one of these old iPods? And on that note, this has been a Hugh Jeffries video. If you like what you saw, hit that subscribe button and consider checking out the restoration playlist for more videos just like this one. And if you're looking for some helpful tips or what tools I use to repair devices, be sure to check out my website, link for which is down in the description. That's all for this video and I'll catch you guys next time.